my fellow former ISA detainees, a very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for taking time to come here to attend this launch of my book. First of all, I would like to thank all my friends who have worked so hard to organize this event for me. You know, they make it happen. <laughs> would you all like to give them a round of applause? <laughs> Today I am actually very happy because at long last, the manuscript which I wrote some 20 years ago did not be kept a secret anymore. It is a relief for me because I no longer need to smile and keep a dumb look when friends and young people ask, hey, write about your experience. <laughs> now I can tell them, well, you can buy a book, help me to defray some costs <laughs> and know all about 1987. Let me tell you why and how this book was written. In a way, I was helped by the ISD. <laughs> a bit of a surprise for all of you. You see, before I was released in 1990, I asked senior ISD officers if I could leave the country for a holiday. And they said, no problem, we'll give you permission to leave in the shortest possible time. So when I was released, I immediately applied for permission to leave Singapore for Australia. They hesitated and they said, look, you've got to show us some proof to, that you are really going away. Uh, how should I do that? Well, you know, you've got to show us your ticket, you know. So I actually applied for a visa and a return air ticket to go to Australia. And then they hesitated again, and finally they said, sorry, you cannot leave Singapore. So what could I do with the rejection? I had already planned my holiday to go to Australia and my sister had sent me some money. I thought, well, I'll, I'll just make good use of that money and uh, I'll buy a computer and learn to use it so that when I restart my legal practice again, it will be a useful skill. So I asked my friends to help me buy a computer and they did that, not only that, they gave me some free lessons. You know, in the 1990s, the computer is not such a simple gadget, you know. It, it took me a bit of time to, to learn to use it. And I learned to use it, and then the idea that perhaps I should just record my experience, my prison experience, came about. So you see, I owe it to the ISD, <laughs> this writing of this manuscript. In those days, I was quite disciplined. I spent several hours every day writing. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I read all the materials concerning the Marxist conspiracy, which I could not read when I was in prison. And finally, when all my writing was done, you know, the chapters were very long because I just wrote whatever that came to my mind, I just wrote. Finally, when it was all done, I asked my good friend, the late Eileen Lau, to read it. She did, and she was one of two friends who read the manuscript. After that, I simply kept the manuscript away and never looked at it for several years. 
I tried to look at it sometime, some years ago, but I just could not read it. And then finally, uh, you know, young people, friends keep bugging me, how, how about writing your experience? And I thought, well, maybe it is time to, to put that manuscript into a book. And so one of the reasons why I retired several years ago was to write, or rather edit this book. But even then, when I came out, I was still doing nothing, you know. Until one day, one of my friends said, hey, you know, you've already retired. You, why don't you just write about your experience in prison? I'll edit the work for you. I said, well, it's quite a good idea. And so I said, OK. So I took out my old manuscript, and I started to work on it. And then I gave my friends by, by installments, you know. And as she read, she said, hey, actually, it's quite interesting. It is of publishable quality. I said, yeah, yeah, of publishable quality. Well, well, um, OK. <laughs> I showed it to a few more friends. And they all agreed that, yes, it, it can be made into a book. And it would be good to set the record straight for posterity. So uh, you know, that, that was one of the reasons why I started to, to make this book happen. Last year, one of my neighbors told me that my name was mentioned in The Man in White. He asked me if I could give him a lesson on Marxism. <laughs> I, I told him I have not read Marx and wish I'm really a Marxist as the government alleged that, that I was one. And he said, I, come on, you lousy Marxist. You don't even know anything about Marx. <laughs> so, you know, I decided to check out this book, Men in White. And actually, I wanted to borrow it from the library. But before I could do that, my good sister-in-law bought a copy for me as a Christmas present. And, and so, you know, I flipped the index, and I found my name, and then I looked at the chapter, and wow, you know, my name was mentioned together with several of my friends, and I read it. And, you know, the authors did not interview me for the book or my co-conspirators. I think they did not even read materials pertaining to the episode. One glaring error is found at page 437 about my appearance and that of Tang Fong Ha and Francis Xiao before the select committee hearing on the Legal Profession Amendment Bill. I quote the paragraph. Both Tio and Tang together with Xiao and several other witnesses, appeared in the select committee hearing at the Parliament House Annex in October before a panel chaired by the Speaker of Parliament, Yeo Gim Seng. They faced relentless questioning by Lee, Law Minister E. W. Barker, and Jaya Kumar. The proceedings held over two days were televised. At the end of the hearing, all were agreed that the law society should keep out of politics. If the authors had bothered to look at the official report of the select committee, they would have discovered that the relentless questioning of the three of us was by the Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew alone. Now sometime in 2007, Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew advised his MPs on the writings of memoirs. He said, when writing memoirs, 
you are talking to posterity. Among them will be historians who will check what you write against the accounts of others. Do not shape the past. My book is my account of what happened in 1987 and what I did before that. I leave you to form your own conclusion as to who is telling the truth, the man in white or I. The alleged Marxist conspiracy, which saw the arrest and imprisonment without trial of 24 people in 1987 and 1988, have caused tremendous hardship and misery to many. Some of those arrested were young polytechnic students, 16, 7 year olds. Imagine the trauma that they had to face at that time when they were arrested. Today, six of the 24 have left Singapore, and several friends who were accused of instigating us are now living abroad. Many of us still suffer the trauma of arrest and imprisonment. And like rape victims, some still cannot speak about their experiences to their families. They would rather be left alone and not be reminded of the episode. As a victim of the ISA, and many in this audience, are also victims. Indeed, victims who have suffered much more than me. I call for the ISA to be abolished. <laughs> the ISA and its predecessors, the Preservation of Public Security Ordinance and the Emergency Regulations have destroyed and damaged many lives from British colonial days till today. We do not know how many have suffered under the ISA, but it would not be wrong to estimate the figure as several thousands. To imprison a person without trial for an indefinite period of time is cruel and inhuman. Singapore, as a, first, as a rich first world nation, cannot tolerate such a law. As early as 1955, Lee Kuan Yew, in arguing against the passage of the Preservation of Public Security Ordinance, said eloquently in the Legislative Assembly, and I quote, if it is not totalitarian to arrest a man and detain him when you cannot charge him with any offence against any written law, if that is not what we have always cried out against the fascist states, then what is it? This can be found in Hansard, September 1955, column 726. Further in his speech, he said, I believe that for seven years now, we have developed an emergency mentality. Many people believe that the only way to keep down any form of agitation, which anybody may have exploited for their own personal or political ends, is by the use of repressive laws, more policemen and more arrests. But this has proved false after seven years. I hate to think that after another three or four years, or whenever it may be when the Chief Minister decides to go back to the people, that it is again to be proved false. It is such a futile answer to the communist challenge. If we are to survive as a free democracy, then we must be prepared in principle to concede to our enemies, even those who do not subscribe to our views, as much constitutional right as you concede yourself. My plea to quote from someone in another context is that the time has come in Malaya for an agonizing reappraisal of strategy and strength, to go blindly in the hope that somehow or the other, 
suppression can prevent latent social, economic and political discontents from manifesting themselves and disrupting the structure of society is a piece of folly to which my party does not subscribe. It is my sincere hope that the senior minister will today reflect on what he said and believed in 1955. More repressive laws, more policemen and more arrests can never prevent latent social, economic and political discontents from manifesting themselves and disrupting the structure of society. Thank you.